Hi, I'm Pastor Darrell Boomer, and I have the privilege of pastoring the New Glarus Bible Church here in the wonderful community of New Glarus, Wisconsin. I want to thank you for taking the time to view one of our worship services. I hope that the worship music inspires you and that the message challenges you and encourages you. Just a little bit about our church. We're a Bible-centered church. In other words, the Bible is at the center of all that we do. It's at the center of our worship services on Sunday morning. It's at the center of all the ministry that we do throughout the week. We're also a family church. We love young families, and we're uh, enjoying watching uh, more and more young families come and join us on Sunday mornings. And uh, we're also a church that cherishes our senior saints. Uh, we would love to have you come visit us sometime. Our worship service begin at 10.30 a.m. each and every Sunday morning, and I promise you'll be warmly greeted at the door. Hope to see you soon. And uh, I want to start off today's service a little bit different. Um, today is going to be definitely a time of celebration, worshiping together. We're going to have four baptisms today, so that makes it a very special day. After the service, we will have cake for all of us to eat. Um, so it's going to be a day of celebration, but I would like it also to be a day of reflection. And uh, so if you just bow your heads for a moment and uh, just want to pray a prayer, lead us in prayer. Father, we acknowledge today as we come in to worship you um, that we are sinners that have been separated from you because of our sin. And Lord, that we have fallen short of the glory of God this week. And so, Lord, you know, we just want to take a moment to reflect on the areas of times that um, perhaps we didn't do what we should have done and the times where we've done things that um, we didn't do what we should have done and times when we have done things that we shouldn't have done. And... Um, Lord, we just confess these before you. Uh, you say in your scriptures that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Lord, we claim that promise this morning. And so, Lord, as we come in to worship you this morning, we come in with clean hands based upon the promises that you've made in your scriptures. Lord, I pray that this would be a time of uh, celebration today. I pray that we'd be able to focus on you Pray that we'd be able to celebrate the things that you have done in the lives of these people that are getting baptized today. And um, we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations.
let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Thank you. 
Well, today is a very special day, and uh, we're going to be eating cake after the service. And uh, after each baptisms, we are going to applaud loudly uh, for the work that God has done in the lives of these people, and also uh, for them having the courage to take this next step of faith. Um, so this week we have been preparing those who are going to get baptized today, uh, helping them to understand what a testimony is, you know, what life was like before Christ, how they came to Christ, and what life is like now after Christ, uh, making sure that they understand that baptism doesn't save them, but rather it is a public declaration that they have been saved. And... Um, we have been preparing them for this next step in their Christian walk. And the thought occurred to me, um, this is what pastors do. Uh, we, we prepare people for the next step in their walk. And um, one of the things we do is we prepare people to get married. Oftentimes you help them with a wedding ceremony, but you try to really help them understand that the wedding ceremony lasts about 30 minutes. Their marriage is going to last for the rest of their lives. So the marriage is actually more important than the ceremony. Uh, we prepare people to, for funerals. You know, people come to you, uh, hopefully people from your congregation, and, and uh, you prepare the funeral ceremony. But more importantly, hopefully you've prepared them to die and to die well. That's a part of what we do. When we're walking through the scriptures, I um, saw that John the Baptist uh, came. And John the Baptist, let's see, hopefully we're all set up here. What is God preparing you for? That's what we're going to talk about today. Um, this is what was spoken about John the Baptist. Jim, my clicker's doing crazy things. So, um, in Matthew chapter 3, speaking of John the Baptist, uh, it says this, This was he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so what John the Baptist did is uh, he came, he was prophesied back in Isaiah 700 years before, and his job was to prepare people for the coming Messiah. He was to prepare their hearts. Uh, we read a little bit later in Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, and it's talking about Jesus choosing his disciples. It talks about one day Jesus is walking along the Sea of Galilee, and he sees the sons of Zebedee, James and John, and it says that they were in a boat with their father Zebedee, and they were preparing their nets. In other words, what they were doing is they were in their boat and they were mending the nets so that fish couldn't swim through them. They were straightening their nets so when they threw it into the water that they would be able to catch fish. It wouldn't be in a knot. And one of the things that a pastor is to do, what a church is to do, is to mend people up. Those people that are hurting and uh, help them sort out their lives so that they can accomplish the things that God has for them. Uh, just as the disciples were preparing their nets, were to prepare people. So today I want to talk about, hopefully briefly, two things. I want to talk about what God has prepared for us, and I'll do that very quickly. And then after that I want to talk about what God is preparing us for. Uh, today these four people are being prepared to take this next spiritual step. Now, what are some things that, that God uses to prepare us? Well, he uses us, his Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Counselor. And what the Holy Spirit does is every once in a while he taps us on the shoulder and he says to us, this is the next step for you. Um, God uses his Holy Word to prepare us for the next step. When we read his Word, oftentimes we'll find in there something where God speaks specifically, this is the next step for you. God uses uh, his church to encourage us uh, along the way to take that next step. God uses pastors and teachers and church leaders to prepare us for the next step. And God uses experiences in our lives to prepare us. We're going to be talking about some of that today. But there's always the next step. 
God always has something next for us, something that he desires for us to do as we walk with Jesus. And my question for you today is, you know, what is your next step? You know, what is God calling you to do? Um, so I want you to know this today. God has prepared a place for you, and he is preparing you for that place. God has a purpose for your life. God has a plan. And as we take those next steps in our lives, what we do is we discover his purpose and his plan. First thing I want to talk about, what has God prepared for us? It says in the book of John, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. Jesus says to his disciples, I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may be where I am. So God has prepared a place for those who are followers of Jesus, and, and uh, that place is called heaven. Uh, my wife was working with her REACH students. She teaches music to homeschoolers, and she was teaching uh, kindergartners and first graders about music. And one of them shot up their hand and asked Lynn a question. They said, Mrs. Boomer, where is heaven? <laughs> and so Lynn immediately said, up, because Jesus went. He ascended up into heaven. And then one of the other students, a kindergartner, first grader, asked her, are there houses in heaven? And so, you know, Lynn, referring to this passage, you know, said, you know, God has prepared a place for us. It's a mansion with many, many rooms. Um, it says in 1 Corinthians, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. God has prepared a place for us. And this place is, is beyond, above and beyond our comprehension. It is going to be like uh, the Garden of Eden, but only better. There, there's not a real estate uh, agent who could write a description of what heaven is going to be like. He has prepared a place for us. It says in, in Revelation chapter 21, this is John uh, on the island of Patmos. He's seeing a vision. He said, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the first earth and the first, uh, the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. God has prepared a place for us. We were at a wedding yesterday, and the bride was beautiful. She had on a beautiful white dress. You know, God has prepared for something for us that is above and beyond our comprehension. But I also want us to know that um, God is preparing us for something. Uh, he, has, he has a purpose and a plan for our life. He, he, he didn't save you to sit and to soak and to sour. He, he actually has things for you to do. And, and if we're following Christ, our, our life will become an adventure. And, and it's the Christian's responsibility to prepare for God's next assignment. Is the next step for our lives as we walk with Jesus. And we're to cooperate with him as he leads us through life. One of the things that he uses is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 13, talks about what God uses. Uh, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ God uses people that he has called I'm going to look specifically at the pastor teacher right here to prepare us and what is he preparing us for well, it says here that he's preparing us for the work of ministry. Uh, one of the things that God does is he, he uses pastors to um, prepare you for meaningful, fruitful, 
spiritual activity. He uses us to prepare you for works of service, uh, ministry, which is work, but it's enjoyable, it's meaningful, and it's fruitful ministry. That's what God uses pastors for. It also says in here that God uses pastors to uh, bring the church into a unity of faith. In other words, what he does is he, he uses us to bring doctrinal unity, um, that we would preach biblical theology. And, and the question that we should always be asking ourselves is this, what does the Bible say? And we always go back to the Bible. And we do that so that the church can reach a doctrinal unity. Uh, we also are to prepare people to become mature, uh, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So we, we prepare people for fruitful ministry, doctrinal unity, and spiritual maturity. And every one of us, it should be desiring to leave spiritual infancy and to pursue spiritual maturity. And that's what a pastor is to do. What we are to do is we are to prepare you um, for the work that God has prepared, created you for. It says in Ephesians 2.10, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. God has a ministry for you. He actually created you for it. And you will be fulfilled as you do it. Um, not only are we to prepare you, we are to be prepared. This is what Paul said to Timothy. I give you this charge, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Uh, correct rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Uh, so uh, what the pastor is to do is he is to be prepared in season and out of season. Uh, we had COVID-19. Do you guys remember that? Yeah, I think it was back in about 1920, I think. 2020, yeah, 2020. But... Um, we, we shut down our church for about three months. And uh, for three months, we developed our, our videotaping uh, capabilities, our, web, our website and stuff like that. Um, but during that time, it was Jim and I in the sanctuary upstairs. And we'd taken a couple pallets and we put them against the wall. We tried to make it look cool and contemporary. And for three months, I, I spoke to a camera. And... It didn't feel like very fruitful ministry. I would call that being out of season. Um, but what we didn't realize at that time, we were planting seeds. Because what we did during that time is the gym has you know, developed the capability for us to broadcast our messages. And many of you have said to, to us that, well, we, we discovered your church by first going to your website. And so that's appeared to be out of season ministry, but it's ended up being fruitful ministry. Um, but we are to be prepared in all seasons. And, and we are, it says here that we're to do it with careful instruction. In other words, don't just throw something together, but rather study to show yourself to prove unto God or a workman that needeth not be ashamed. Uh, rightly dividing the word of God. Another thing that we are to prepare the church family for is, is to live. Um, Paul writes in Ephesians, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to, to live a life that is worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble, gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. So uh, one of the things that we are to do is to prepare you to live. And, and we're to prepare you to live a life that is worthy of the calling that you have received. What is the calling that you have received? Well, one day, you know, you're going to go to heaven as a follower of Christ. And what he's saying there is that we are to live a life that is equal to that calling that we have on our lives. Um, that's why we gather here on Sunday. That's why we have Sunday school. That's why we have men's Bible studies and women's Bible studies. Barna reported back in 2021 
that in the United States, only 9% of those adults who identify as Christians possess a biblical worldview. Only 9% of those who profess to be Christians have a biblical worldview. Uh, the study said that every person has a worldview, and they do. Uh, your worldview is um, defined as an intellectual, emotional, and spiritual decision-making filter. In other words, we all have a, a way that we see the world. Um, but only 9% of those who profess to be Christians have a biblical worldview. Uh, it said, and, and though many Americans believe they have a biblical worldview, very few do. And um, our goal here is to make sure that everybody sees the world through the eyes of the scriptures. Um, you know, how can we know how to live if we don't know what God tells us how to live? So, third, we're to prepare you for suffering and persecution. This is really encouraging, isn't it? But... It says in uh, 2 Timothy, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. We live in a time that can only be described as upside down and backwards. Are you in agreement with that? We live in an absolutely crazy time right now. And um, anyone who is living right according to the scriptures is deemed as being wrong according to our culture. And that which is wrong is being promoted as right. And so if we are living according to God's word, um, we will eventually be persecuted. And one of the jobs of the church, I believe, is to prepare us for that. Um, last week I was memorizing this verse. So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. And, and you know, I'm looking at this passage and it, it says here that, that there are going to be those who suffer according to God's will. Well, I, I thought that becoming a Christian was going to be like all unicorns and buttercups and rainbows, right? And it's really not. If you're attempting to follow Jesus, you will suffer at some point. Um, you will at one point um, perhaps get the short end of a stick. Uh, perhaps you won't even get the stick, the, the short end. Uh, you will perhaps be lied about or lied to or cheated. Um, and we need to understand that that might be according to God's will. You know, he's called us to live a godly life in the midst of this. And uh, what we are to do then is to commit ourselves to our faithful creator. And we are to continue to do good. Are you with me? This is what... Um, our job is to prepare you for things to be difficult. A, a fourth thing that we're to prepare you for is the, uh, we're to prepare you to be prepared to give an answer for the hope and the faith that you have. It says in 1 Peter 3.15, But in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone uh, who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. As we have been preparing um, these baptismal candidates, um, to get baptized, we've been talking to them about how do you prepare a testimony? You know, what, what was your life before Christ? How did you come to Christ? What's life like now? And in doing that, what we're actually doing is we're preparing them for when they're having a conversation with a family member or a friend to tell about their experience with Christ. We're preparing them to, to be able to give the reason for the hope that they have. And then hopefully, and I believe that they will, they'll do it with gentleness and respect. 
there's there's one more thing that we are to prepare you for and and that is to finish well finish well the apostle paul finished well and so this is what he writes to timothy young timothy a pastor he he wants him to be encouraged by his experience and and to finish well paul writes this he says for i'm already being poured out like a drink offering and, and and the time has come for my departure paul is soon going to die for his faith he says i have fought the good fight i have finished the race I, the race i have kept the faith now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness which the lord the righteous judge will award to me on that day and not only to me timothy but also to all of those who have longed for his appearing. You know, and, and so one of the things that even that I'm doing today, we got young people here today, we got, we got older people. Um, my job is to prepare you to finish well. And one of the things that I do with um, pastors that I rub shoulders with that are, that are older, um, I encourage them. Just finish well. Just finish well. Just keep going. In, in um, the front of my Bible, I got this Bible back in 2021, June. And uh, I wrote at the very beginning, fourth quarter ministry determined to finish well. And um, this is an encouragement to me, but I want to encourage you to do the same. Um, Paul died a, a happy warrior. He was, he was filled with joy. So I have a question for you. And my question is this. You know, where's the Lord leading you? And what is your next step? What, what is the Holy Spirit who is tapping on your shoulder, perhaps even right now, you know, what is he whispering into your ear? What might he want you to do? Is there a ministry that he might want you to pick up? Is there a, a church he might want you to commit to? Is there a, uh, something that is hard, something that is difficult that he's, he's saying to you, you know what, I, I want you to take this next step. So these four people today are a good example of what it means to trust the Lord and to take the next step. So what we're going to do is we're going to invite uh, Lawrence and Marie to come up. Lawrence and uh, Lawrence is going to give his testimony, and uh, Marie's going to affirm, uh, make some affirmations before she gets baptized. If you guys come on up, and then after that we'll have Brad and Christy come on up. Yeah. These are our newer people to our church, and we're delighted to have them. Lawrence, how did you guys find us? Uh, YouTube, I think. There we go. Yeah, I think it's YouTube. <laughs> there so, we go. Um, I just wanted to put a plug in for that. Yeah. For, <laughs> <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to do my best to stick to this. I'm not good at speaking. There's a lot of you. <laughs> uh, I don't believe you're going to say anything. She's going to stand here and... Encourage. Be here for me, encourage me. Um, for, uh, for all those uh, that don't know uh, me just yet, uh, my name is Lawrence Burrell, and this is my beautiful wife, Marie. Uh, as for my testimony in Christ, uh, Jesus brought me to himself in November of 2022 at the age of 44. Uh, now, I know that being saved at 44 is a bit late in life, uh, but better late than never. Uh, plus, who am I to question our Lord's timing? Uh, before I was saved, I always thought of myself as an overall nice person, so how could I be a sinner? I wasn't uh, a womanizer, I wasn't a thief, I wasn't a murderer. I wasn't uh, anything that our society labeled as a criminal or a bad person, uh, so how could I be a sinner? Um, however, I did notice that I had skeletons. I just wasn't aware that at that time that those skeletons were also known as sin. <clears throat> in, um, in the summer of 2022, I started to notice that I was changing inside, but that change was not for the better. I started to harden. I started to uh, no longer care about living or life. 
outside of still wanting to live on with Marie. Uh, I just viewed life as more of a burden um, than a true blessing, which it is. Uh, Over the next several months, I started to worsen. I started to notice actual mental and physical changes happening to me. Uh, I was in decline. I felt that I was losing control of mind and body. And this is when I, uh, the real desperation started to set in for me. Um, at that point, I hadn't uh, shared any of these uh, thoughts or issues with anyone, not even Marie. Uh, eventually, I did build up enough uh, desperation courage uh, to discuss uh, what I was dealing with and experiencing in a phone conversation with my dad. Uh, my dad listened to everything that I said, every word, and I had a lot to share. Uh, sharing uh, his thoughts and experiences with me as I continued. Uh, At the end of my confession, my dad told me, boy, you need to start praying to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Uh, As time passed and I continued to worsen in desperation, I started praying to Jesus Christ. I found myself praying to him all the time, at multiple times throughout the day. Uh, I was at the end of my rope, uh, at least as close to the end of that rope that I was willing to go. Uh, This is when I also happened to realize that I was truly a sinner and that I needed to be saved and that I needed a Savior. Um, I would often pray, Jesus Christ, if you're real, I need you. I need you in my life more than ever, as I can no longer do this on my own. Uh, Please forgive me of all my sins. Help me. Save me. Please heal me. Uh, I continued to pray like this over the next three weeks or so with uh, no response, nothing. I was pouring uh, out my heart and still nothing. Uh, One night I woke up around two in the morning as that was normal for me uh, for several months at that time. I would uh, would wake and start praying until I fell asleep, uh, but this time was different. I awoke and felt a dark and evil presence in the room with me. It was creepy. Uh, To remind everyone, grown man in my 40s, and I was seriously freaked out. So Um, so I started praying, uh, Jesus Christ, please be with me, save me, please protect me. Uh, As I continued to pray, I felt an elastic tug at my chest, pulling my chest toward the ceiling. Uh, that pulling then separated from me, I know it sounds odd, and released, snapping back at my chest like a rubber band. Um, I was left uh, with a small white light warmth feeling uh, in the very center of my chest, which uh, I can only describe as the most unbelievable form of love that I can't even begin to explain. That small white light slash warmth began to grow and radiate within me, increasing in volume and the overall feeling of pure love um, as it expanded as a wave rippling throughout my entire body, leaving me in awe without words. Um, My dad later explained to me that that white light, the warmth uh, that I experienced was the Holy Spirit and my salvation. How beautiful is that? Um, That was the exact moment in time that I was saved. My eternal soul was saved through the grace and love Uh, by the blood of our Lord and Savior, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. (laughs) I have a little bit more. (laughs) Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Um, As a a newly saved man, uh, I no longer find myself cursing as I used to, listening to the same music, watching the same movies or videos, uh, full of just like a silent rage or anger. Um, entertaining evil thoughts or actions, or even craving uh, the riches of this world. Uh, Those are just a few things that are noticeable. Um, There's a lot more. (laughs) In closing, um, I was graciously gifted a new heart and new spirit in Jesus Christ. Um, I'm a new man in Christ, a man that has changed for the better. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Appreciate it. Okay. Okay, I want to talk to Marie real quick. All right. Marie. (laughs) So, uh, are you thankful for what happened there? Oh, immensely. (laughs) (laughs) All right. I have uh, just three questions from Marie, uh, affirmation questions before I baptize her. 
Uh, Marie, do you know that you are a sinner in need of a Savior? I do. Do you understand that Jesus is the only one who can save you from your sin? I do. Have you repented of your sin and accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior? Yes, I have. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to delight to baptize you. <laughs> <laughs> This is Brad and Chrissy, and uh, we're glad to have Brad here today, and Chrissy. <laughs> so, which way I went? Hi everyone, I'm Christy. I've had a long journey to get here, but I feel so thankful and fortunate to be able to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. I had a rough childhood. My parents were excommunicated Mormons. Then my dad eventually became atheist. I would follow in his footsteps because he was the Ivy League intellectual. My mom conversely battled mental illness, and while she read the Bible, she did not share the gospel with me or my siblings. When I was 14, my older sister, then my dad, then my older brother, left the house within a, few, a span of a few months. So it was up to me at the age of 14 to get a job, pay the bills, take care of my mom, and stay in school. But I did it, and obviously I couldn't uh, focus on my spiritual health at the time. Um, I was just barely surviving, and I had to be career-driven with no financial safety net. I would go on to graduate from UW-Madison with a bachelor's in nursing, eventually got my master's, so I had career success I met my husband, Brad, in college, got married, started a family. Um, but, I, you know, I, I had success, so, and, 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 and too, we had built a big, modern, fancy house in the Milwaukee suburbs. Um, but something was missing, and I couldn't put my finger on it. Um, my generation's supposed to be happy by consuming Netflix, social media, shopping, fashion, the latest restaurants, but I was actually getting quite bored of it all. There had to be more to life. Becoming a parent had changed me as well. It led me to want to believe that there was a Heavenly Father watching over us. Being a parent actually led me to my first true prayer about five years ago. I say it's my first prayer because I started it with genuine thankfulness. We were going through a period of secondary infertility after having two girls, so I pray God, thanking first and foremost of my beautiful daughters. Um, and please, if it is your will, uh, consider giving us a third child. And if it's not too much for it to be a healthy little boy. <laughs> and if so, I'd start going to church because I thought that's what he'd want my first step to be. So something really amazing happened. I instantly felt this sense of relief. I thought, I have my two girls, why should I want for more? I started crying because I felt like this weight had been taken off my shoulders. I stopped worrying about what I wanted. And it had a really profound impact on me because I never had reassuring parents. My mom, if I would ever go up to her with an important question, she'd turn on the vacuum cleaner and pretend to clean. She never, never cleaned, really. Um, but then something, even more amazing happened about a month later. I found out I was pregnant with my son. Uh, so my, my prayer was truly answered, and I would not forget my promise. I actually set a date in my head of the following spring, March 2020. <laughs> yep, March 2020, I'm going to church. <laughs> well, anyone remember <laughs> what happened? Yeah, it was the worst time in recent history to, to go looking for a church with open doors. There was such chaos, it seemed like the world was going crazy. My job had completely changed, so I quit. We started homeschooling my oldest daughter, and when I ordered her curriculum, I thought, well, it wouldn't hurt to have a Bible in the house as well. Also, our taxes on our big fancy house were going through the roof, and if we're not supposed to entertain people anyhow, what's really the point of it? So we put our house on the market. I remember the night before our first open house, I did my second big prayer. I asked God if this is your will, if you really want us to change our lives, please give us a sign. 
Well, the first person who sees our house gives us a full asking price, cash offer, no contingencies, not even an inspection, leave the house in less than 30 days. And not only that, but he says, I want all of your stuff too. All the furniture, the artwork, the books, everything. Everything but the clothes and the kids stuff. Our real estate agent, the number one boutique broker in the entire state of Wisconsin said she's never seen anything like it in all of her years. <laughs> So basically, an offer to give up all of your worldly possessions. Wow, talk about a change. And a sign, so we took it. And the day that we sold and closed on our home, I even accidentally put my phone on the roof of the car, and that was left in Milwaukee too, along the side of the freeway. Um, our plan was to travel and search for a place out in the country to live. So I wake up in the second-rate Airbnb the next morning, and I thought, what are we doing here? I brought my kids here. This is crazy. I can't even contact my old friends, because I didn't have a phone. But I look down at one of the few boxes we were able to bring, and I see my $3 Bible, and I thought, hmm, well, this is a fresh start as any. Maybe I'll learn something meaningful. So for the very first time, I opened up a Bible. And I started Genesis chapter 1. I didn't get very far because the kids woke up and wanted to go to a playground. So we did walk to a park. And I'm there not a few minutes, and this lady starts walking up to me. She's coming very, very close. A very bold thing to do during COVID. And immediately asks me an odd question. Are you a Christian? And I'm taken aback. I didn't know if I was quite correct in answering this, but I didn't want to scare her off, so I said, yes. And she's quite friendly, easy to talk to, so we start chatting. I tell her about our plans of travel. I just started homeschooling my kids. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, it turns out she homeschooled her kids, thinks what we're doing makes perfect sense, applauds us on going on such a great adventure, and gives me sage advice. Then, as she's about to leave, she turns to me and says, you know, I was just driving along, listening to the Christian radio station, and I felt this strong urge for some reason to come to this park, and I think I came for you. I thanked her and thought, hmm, well, that's quite a coincidence. First time I open up my Bible and that happens, well, maybe I'm on the right track. Uh, I'll keep reading my Bible, and I did. We traveled for about a year in mostly rural places, marveling at God's creation. It wasn't easy to read the Bible on my own, especially starting with the Old Testament. But I picked up a free copy of the book of Matthew after I had lost some motivation, and I read the Sermon on the, on the Mount. Wow, I finally got it. It was the most sensible thing I had ever read in my whole life. The amount of wisdom from someone who had come from such humble beginnings was unbelievable, and from several accounts, as I'd later find out after reading the rest of the New Testament. I started making decisions based on faith. At the end of our journey, we took a chance on a rental of a farmhouse on 21 acres near teeny tiny Postville, Wisconsin, before even being able to set foot inside the house. I would not have been able to take a leap of faith like that before, but somehow, within seconds of setting foot on my land, I just knew I was home. Reading the Bible has given me a much more purposeful drive. Putting God first puts it all into line. I'd love to thank this church community for encouraging me on this path, giving me a better understanding of the word of God and the power of prayer. Thank you for listening to my story. I'm glad to follow these great testimonies. Uh, we didn't really talk about much of this. We sort of reached parallel processes, which is interesting. So, uh, Life before I trusted Christ. My true testimony is only about Christ without a word about myself. I am a sinner. Jesus came to earth, died, and rose again for my sins to be forgiven. And I accept that gift and commit to living my life through him with faith and repentance for the glory of God. My life before being born again was blessed but ignorant. Over time, the sign of God's work became difficult to ignore and ignorance became difficult to maintain. Consumption was my primary God. Media, dining out, products of all sorts, 
and this constant stream kept me distracted from anything meaningful. It didn't seem like it at the time, but it tainted nearly everything I did. COVID was a blessing for me because it interrupted the flow I was stuck in in such a profound way that I was forced to change course. Our usual parade of social gatherings and obligations halted and we were left with some quiet time. It was during this time that my eyes opened somewhat simultaneously to several life truths. Uh, subjects like the nature of money, the contemporary Western narrative, moral relativism, and the most profound truth, God. Changes in what was considered good versus evil seemed to invert around me within a matter of years and nothing really made sense anymore and I was lost. I can think of two pivotal moments during this gradual process that stand out as inflection points. I recall while seemingly homebound initially during COVID, Christy and I were putting the finishing touches on our newly built dream house and I had what I refer to as the spice rack epiphany. This sounds ridiculous. Uh, prior to this, I was starting to realize the why of why I did anything was tenuously superficial. Asking myself in earnest, why do I do this, started to wake me from a deep trance. I was, good. I was just going through the motions at that point. I was sitting at the counter making a list of all the spices I wanted to have available in our new kitchen. And as I finished my list of spices, I started to search for a, uh, search for a suitable matching display jars. We had most of the spices already, but all the spices were in different size and shape jars. And I asked Christy, is it worth it to spend $150 on new matching spice jars? Why do we have to have matching spice jars? Who am I trying to impress with my matching spice jars? And would anyone impressed by my matching spice jars really care about me as a person? Would anyone who really cares about me care if my spice jars weren't matching? And so began this line of examining why I did anything. It seems silly, but when you ask why you're doing something, you can get really surprised by the answer. And as I applied this painful inward gaze to the reasoning behind all my actions, the answers horrified me, and everything I had built up around me suddenly lost value. Uh, it, it, it's hard to express having just finished this dream house and put in all this work and got all this stuff, and I'm working on the spice rack, and it's like one of the last things, and then it's like, I don't even like any of this anymore. And that's when we sold everything we had and we hit the big reset button. There's scripture that describes the situation exactly if one would only listen and take it to heart, but I had to learn it the hard way. So despite COVID, we moved around the country for a few years, Hawaii, Big Island, Oahu, Door County, Savannah, Georgia, Salida, Colorado, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, Prescott, Arizona, Kentucky, trying to figure out God's path for us and the true why, how I came to know Christ. The pivotal moment for me where I knew in my heart beyond the shadow of a doubt that I was on the right path was when I witnessed the life and death miracle. I asked God for help when I was intellectually certain that all was lost and he answered immediately and profoundly. And I knew then that everything in my world was here because of him and in that moment I surrendered myself to Jesus forever. For me this experience was akin to witnessing Jesus perform a miracle in the flesh. That's the only way I can put it. I spent my whole life in medicine and none of it made sense. To this day, the thought of life without God's grace is so painful that I cringe at the mere thought of it. And I remind myself what's truly good in this material world that we temporarily occupy. How I've changed since accepting Christ. Now I'm actively learning what is good and true by studying the Bible and reconciling that with my innate sinful nature suggests is easiest. Breaking bad habits, reinventing thought patterns, finding real value. Through this relearning, I improve myself, which improves the standing of my loved ones. What I never understood in my pride and sloth was that the guidance in the scriptures wasn't a punishment, because it contradicts man's sinful nature, therefore heeding the word is difficult. But rather that the guidance in the scripture helps me make good decisions that improve my soul and improve the souls of those that my good deeds touch. But to start that process of realization, I needed to truly accept the new covenant and I needed to understand that it isn't acts or deeds that get me to heaven, but rather the true change of heart that comes with the acceptance of Jesus as my savior that can sustainably drive everything good that follows. 
I never understood Jesus before. I never understood the new covenant. And now I understand and accept that everything else seems to fall into place. Without doing that, I simply would continue to float around from opportunity to opportunity, blind and without direction. Thinking back to when I used to think I was a learned man, that I knew everything in my college days, but I, I truly knew nothing, I came across a quote I never fully understood, which always stuck with me. Werner Heisenberg, the father of quantum physics, said, the first gulp from the glass of the natural sciences will make you an atheist. But at the bottom of the glass, God is waiting for you. And back then, I was lacking any real answers to the most important questions, like why? But eventually, I found the bottom of my glass, and I'm publicly confessing this truth through being baptized. Good job, Tom. We're going to go over there. Okay. Good job. Yeah. Well, after hearing those testimonies, I am truly um, joyful in the opportunity to baptize these people. So, isn't it amazing the way God works in people's lives? Yeah. Right? You want to take off your... There you go. All right. If you need help. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Wow. Wow, what stories. Yeah. yeah. So you want to grab my hand with you? There we go. So, uh, Lawrence, um, based on the profession of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There we go. <laughs> That's right. Yes. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Marie, you ready? All right. Yes, yeah, it's like bath water. <laughs> All right. And Marie, based upon your profession of faith, the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Grab my mate. There we go. There we go. Who's next? Okay, Christy. There you go. You want to grab on my hand with it? There, there we go. And Christy, um, I enjoyed all the testimonies today. Just, it's amazing the way God works. But based upon the profession of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is awesome. These are great people. <laughs> All righty. Um, based upon the profession of your faith in Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> there we go.
Jesus.